Since joining us in 2018, they've grown their business from 12 million to 25 million. So give a round of applause for Bruce and Mike. How many of your grandparents out here? See your hand? I have one quick grandfather story to tell you before we get going. Uh, when my oldest granddaughter was just three years old, her mother, Jen, took her to lunch. And they met Teresa, Jen's friend, who was nine months pregnant. She was out to here. And uh, Jen looked at little Anna and said, look, Anna, Teresa has a baby in her tummy. Anna thought about it and got very concerned and said, we don't eat babies. How did that baby get in there? That woman must have, she wouldn't look at Teresa the rest of the lunch hour. So uh, before we get going, let's do some housekeeping. Uh, you have a folder in front of me. Why don't you pick that up and wave it at me? Folders? Okay, thanks. Inside the folder on the left side, you have a tan sheet. That tan sheet is not Willy Wonka's golden ticket, but it is your ticket for dinner. And so if you would complete that, we'll be picking those up at the conclusion of the presentation. And uh, the, the green folder right in front of that tan sheet talks a lot about our company and some things about Mike Douglas, your presenter tonight. Now let me just say this about Mike Douglas. Mike is wise beyond his years. He has educated himself to become an expert in retirement planning, investment planning, and estate planning. Mike's married to Kimberly. They have four children under the age of seven, so he's a busy guy. And he runs our Howell operation. Now, on the right side, this has been a magnet for our business, and that's our RIA. And that has done very well. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that other than if you have need for managed money, uh, the second page has a QR code and a landing page. Feel free to utilize that for more information. W let's talk about the things Mike will not address tonight. Mike's not going to talk about products. So in other words, our hybrid account that is managed by J.P. Morgan without any management fees, it's averaged over 6.5% per year, and has a floor under it so that if Iraq gets crazy and the market drops 30%, it's not going to go below the floor. A lot of people like that, some of that in their portfolio. Others like managed money. And the managed money that Mike's not going to talk about, I call it our boring account. Our boring account has one-third the risk of the S&P, and yet last year did 19% and has averaged over 13.5% in the last five years. It's a boring account. Our growth account last year did 35%. So Mike's not going to talk about products. Now, before we get going, I want to tell you what the late Liz Taylor told her eighth husband. We're not going to keep you long. We're not long-winded speakers. Mike will be done in about an hour. You can set your stomachs to 12 o'clock. We're going to start tonight with a South Park video. Now, you can relax. It's family-friendly, but I think it'll bring a smile. Let's start the video now. Do I really have to do this, Dad? Stan, now more than ever, you need to understand the importance of saving money. But Grandma said I could use this money to buy whatever I want. Okay, next, please. Go on, Stanley. How can I help you, young man? I got a hundred dollar check from my grandma, and my dad said I need to put it in the bank so it can grow over the years. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. What's all gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I, I have a hundred dollars. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. Well, well, what can I do to get back I'm my- I'm sorry, sir, but this line is for bank members only. I just opened an account. 
Do you have any money invested with this bank? No, you just lost it all. Then please stand aside for people who actually have money with us. Next, please. Hey! Hello, Mrs. Farnickel. How are you today? Making a deposit, are we? Great. We can just put that into your retirement account and make it go to work for you, and it's gone. What? Sorry, yeah, that's gone. Please step aside for people who actually have money with the bank. Next, please. Dad! Hey, I'm trying to teach my son the importance of savings. You already lost his money? Oh, Mr. Marsh, d don't worry. We can just transfer money from your account into a portfolio with your son, and it's gone! This line is for people who have money with the bank only. Please step aside. Let's welcome Mike Douglas. Thank you. My wife, Kimberly, and I, for years, have enjoyed going to see shows. We've seen The Lion King live. We've seen Beauty and the Beast, Phantom of the Opera, just about any show, Wicked, several times. But I'll tell you, my favorite one we've ever seen was Riverdance. About 12 years ago, they came through East Lansing here. And as we went to the show, we went to the Wharton Center. And at the Wharton Center, we sat in that room. What's interesting, if you see a live orchestra perform, something happens. We got there early for that show. And when you get to a live orchestra about 15 minutes before the show, what you hear is an orchestra warming up. When an orchestra warms up, you may hear a violinist playing scales. You may hear a timpani player just bong bong tuning the timpanis. Maybe even a trombone player doing some warm-ups. It doesn't sound good. And if the whole night sounded like that, we'd say, what the heck did I just pay 100 bucks a ticket for? It sounds very chaotic, almost like jazz, but not quite. But as the night gets closer to the start, all of a sudden the lights dim down. The crowd sits in their seats and they get quiet. And then the conductor comes walking across the stage. Or with Riverdance, he went down in the pit because they got all the dancing that's about to happen. And as he gets there, everybody cheers, gets excited. And now the audience is at full attention because when that conductor comes to the podium, something's about to happen. Now, just moments before, we heard professional musicians sound terrible. What were they doing? They're preparing. They're getting themselves ready for this big event. But that conductor comes on the stage, he stands on the podium, he lifts his baton and he counts them in. And when that downbeat hits, there's no more chaos, there's no more confusion. These professional musicians and professional instruments sound amazing. They sound classical, they sound trained, they sound intentional. And what you hear from that moment on is the soundtrack to the rest of the evening. This beautiful experience, I'll probably remember Riverdance the rest of my life because it was so good. But what's interesting about Riverdance is they had a fiddle solo. Now, remember the 70s and 80s and the, the guitar solos that would go six, seven, eight minutes long? Riverdance had a fiddle solo that went about five and a half minutes long. And as he stands on the edge of the stage and he's excited and he's playing his solo, I remember thinking to myself, I wonder why he got into fiddle playing. I don't think you get into it because you think it's the fastest way to a couple million dollars, right? Oh, I'm going to become rich. Let's play the fiddle. No, I think you do it because you're passionate about it. It probably started in third grade with piano lessons. Then maybe fifth grade or sixth grade, getting into the middle school band or orchestra. And then they got into high school. And then he went into college and studied and took private lessons and did all this preparation for years and years. Then he auditioned for his first orchestra. Maybe it was Riverdance, maybe it wasn't. Audition and got there and then worked his way up to being first chair so someday he could stand on the stage like the Wharton Center and live out his perfect life, live out his dream of playing fiddle for thousands of people. Now, some of you in the room tonight may say, you couldn't pay me enough money to get up and play, sing. You, might, you wouldn't even stand on this stage and talk in front of 40 people in this restaurant. And that's okay. But everybody has an ideal stage they want to stand on the rest of their life. And we have these instruments that we've been working on for years. Now, you say, Mike, what the heck does this have to do with retirement planning? Well, we have these different instruments that we've been preparing to play with at some point in our life. It's a financial instrument. You have a 401k, a 403b, a 457, real estate, REITs, annuities, long-term care insurance, life insurance, whatever it is you have. You've built up this financial orchestra with the intention of someday, these are gonna play out the song of my retirement. These will be the song of the rest of my life. But while we're working, there's a big difference in working money and retirement money. Working money is, I just need all these instruments to get bigger and better. As long as they go up, I should be fine. 
And when you're 30 and the market crashes, you don't care because you got time and it's going to recover and you're going to make a lot of money on the run up. But there's a couple things we focus on when we look at retirement. The first thing is protection of my money, the preservation. It's a different shift. So I have these instruments that have trained for years and years to someday play out the soundtrack of my retirement. But we get to a point where we're saying, you know what? I can't have this thing over here, this thing over here, this thing over here. It's like having this warming up orchestra. At some point, things change. And there needs to be a conductor that comes onto that stage. Not for the sake of stealing the spotlight or anything like that, but they are the conductor to conduct the instruments so you can stand on the stage that you desired. You can live out your perfect retirement life. Now, at Life Plan, one of the things we measure the most is how many perfect retirement days do you get to live in any given year? Perfect retirement days. What does that look like? Because we all have a stage we want to stand on. Maybe it is standing up in front of people or, or talking or, or, or traveling and speaking. That's great. Maybe it's not. Maybe your stage is, uh, we have all these different things we want to do. We want to snowbird out of Michigan. We want to get down south in these next couple months. How do I know if I have a great plan? Well, last year, did you snowbird four, four weeks? Can we do it five this year? Can we do it six this year? Or if we have some major market correction, does that mean I don't get to snowbird as much? Well, that's a different plan. Maybe one of your stages looks like snowbirding. Maybe your snowbirding or your stage is traveling the world. You have a bucket list. You want to kiss the Blarney Stone. I had one lady who came in and said, my goal in my life is to set foot on all seven continents. That's a good one. I said, do you mind if I steal that? She, I don't. So that's one of our family goals now is for Kimberly and I to set foot on all seven continents. Not a lot of time in Antarctica, but a little bit. <laughs> but maybe you have goals of traveling. Maybe you want to spend time with kids and grandkids. If you have kids all over the country... You want to par spend part of your retirement going around and seeing them. Or maybe you're someone who retired from work and became a semi-professional babysitter three days a week from 9 a.m. until 3.30 p.m. And you need a couple days off for you. Whatever that is, building out plans that say regardless of the market, regardless of all these things that are out of your control, we're going to make intentional decisions, work with a conductor who is very specific about giving you control back, not to the government, not to the IRS, and not to the stock market, Twitter, or anything else. It's about you and your retirement. So how do we measure success? Well, we look at four keys to retirement. We're going to call them the four pillars tonight. The four things that you can do to take back control, be intentional, and specific. How many of you are the grocery shopper in your family? You raise hands. It's all right. Like three people in this whole place grocery shop? My goodness, it's a bunch of Amazon Prime shoppers. All right, I'm going to come down for a second. Is it Nick, right? Yeah. Nick, when you go grocery shopping, are you a list person or are you a roamer? Um, roamer. Roamer. What do you look for when you roam? I just know what's in the house and I'm looking for what I, what I need. What you need. Now, before you go into the store, so you know what's in the house, you know what's short, so you have like a mental list going, really. But when you look around the store and you see something you need, do you just go grab it regardless of price and say, I really don't care about that, I'm just going to chuck it in the cart, whatever, or do you look for stickers? I pretty much throw it in the cart. Throw it in the cart. You don't care about price at all. I got a timeshare thing I got to talk to you about later. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but most of us, for the most part, and I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads around the room, we say, you know what? Uh, price matters to a certain extent, right? I'll tell you what, I have four kids, nine, seven, five, and four. I'm super excited to be here with you guys tonight. My wife's not so thrilled, but that's okay. I'll take her home something tonight. But I know the price of milk in every store in Livingston County. I do. I didn't mention this, but three of the kids are boys. We go through some groceries. We go through some stuff. So whether you're looking at the cost of, of milk, gas, grocery, whatever else, I know that on average milk right now is about $1.69 a gallon. So for me, if I get to the checkout lane and that milk scans at $6, let me ask you this, Nick. If you know something's supposed to be about two bucks, that's too, much. that's too much, right? We know it's too much. And are you going to say, you know what, Kroger, you win today. I want to bless you with some extra money. Or are you going to get say, hey, that's actually not the right price. Can we get it right? All right. I think that's the way most of us operate. I don't expect my groceries to be free, nor do I expect them to massively discount everything because sometimes free stuff's cheap. But what I really expect is that when the sticker said $1.69, that I pay $1.69. That's all I really want is fair value. 
And so we go through the grocery store and we put all these things in our carts. Then we get to the checkout lane and all of a sudden now imagine this, there's no screen. It doesn't tell you the price of each item. They just scan the cart and say, you know what, it's about 350 bucks, let's call it that. I have four kids, guys, I know what $350 of groceries looks like. It's a cart in front and a cart behind. That or I'm at Costco. <laughs> Costco is the only place, Kimberly says all the time, how do we spend $300 and still not have anything for dinner? I don't know, but I got some ratchet straps I didn't plan on buying today, so that works out. <laughs> but you get through the grocery aisle, and they get to the scan out lane, and they scan everything for you, and they don't even show you what everything costs. You say, can I get a receipt? Now we don't really do receipts, but tell you what, you can go to a manufacturer's website, and they'll tell you how much each thing should cost at a store. Is there any way any of us would shop at that grocery store? Not a chance. If we talk about our investments, the first thing you can do to protect yourself from the bad times in the market, from the what ifs, from the should be's, is knowing exactly what you're paying for stuff. I wouldn't go to a grocery store that charged me $6 for $1.69 worth of milk, Nick, I really wouldn't. But at the end of the day, that's three or $4, right? We're talking about a couple dollars. In our portfolios, we have fees of some type associated with almost every investment. Now the fee could be liquidity, the fee could be risk. The fee could be dollars and the fees could be percentage points. There are a lot of different types of fees inside of your portfolio. So figuring out exactly what you're being charged for everything is a great piece of taking control back. But what we do oftentimes is we have this grocery cart financially that goes through the store and we just have our 401k. Well, in a 401k, it's like a store of 12,000 grocery items. They say, shop this aisle. There's only 30 things in that aisle. Do the best you can. And we do. We work hard to do the best we can to grow our accounts. Then you have this Roth IRA over here, it's something different, and this life insurance in the life insurance section. You have all these different pieces, and you don't really know what each thing's individually costing you. A lot of times we say, you know what, I'll pay someone 1% to go shop for me. Can they go around and fill my cart with what I probably should have about now? Yeah, I'll pay them 1%. And so you're paying someone the 1%, and all we think is, you know what, I paid 1% for a grocery cart full of investments. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs. And if that was it, that'd be great. But oftentimes, it's not just the fact that you're paying someone to shop for you, there's also a cost of the groceries. There's a cost to mutual funds. Forbes tells us on average it's about 1.2% for an average mutual fund. That's not high, that's not low, that's right in the middle. I'll tell you this, most investments, I'm not pro or con, there's about two things I'm almost always against, but generally speaking, I think it's about where are you in your life? I hope your 25-year-old son has a different portfolio than you do at 65. I hope that your kids have different structures of investments than you do as you're looking at retirement. Finding the right things at the right place in life. But you go through and we have this cart and we say, all right, I'm paying 1%, but there's all these fees and there's some high expense mutual funds, low expense mutual funds, and it's not just mutual funds. A lot of things have fees on them. But Forbes tells us that even though the average mutual fund sticker price on the shelf is 1.2%, about 1.19, when you actually go through and scan it at the register, if you dig deep into the prospectus, how do you find these fees? Well, you can read the prospectus. I'll tell you, you can lose a couple perfect retirement days right there. You want to bore yourself to sleep? Get some prospectus and do some digging. But inside the prospectus, it tells you the average mutual fund cost is actually 3.73%. We're talking a 2.5% difference. Not, not $4.50 on milk, but on $500,000, that's $12,500. Extra fees. But all I knew is I was paying the 1% for someone to shop for me. Yeah, but you paid some other guy $12,500 you didn't even know about. So how do we find that out? The first thing you can do is you can read the prospectus, do the digging yourself, because they don't give you an itemized receipt. Nobody ever goes through and gives you a line by line. Here's exactly what you're paying. One of the things we offer tonight, there's no cost or obligation to it, but one of the themes of the evening is to give you the information to make great decisions for yourself to empower you to take control back of your retirement. So we will put together a receipt for you. We'll scan every investment in your cart, everything. We'll do the digging. If you've got a variable annuity, we'll dig through that 700 page prospectus. We'll dig through the mutual funds. We'll dig through the ETFs and find out what you're paying. And we'll give you that receipt. It's just for you to take it. You come in, sit down for 45 minutes and we give you that receipt. And from there, you make some choices about your, about your portfolio. Now, I'll tell you, I did one of these, and there's a guy named Jeff sitting right about where you're sitting. And as we went through, he came and sat down. Jeff had $2.2 million. And as we looked through it, he had 95 positions that we needed to scan for him. I'll tell you this, we didn't knock that out in 45 minutes. Our team had to get to work for him, or about a week. Then we sat back down a week later, and I said, Jeff, 
you're paying nothing in fees. It's a very risky portfolio, but you're paying nothing in fees. Are you okay with the risk? Actually, I really like the risk. I'm comfortable with risk. I enjoy risk. I have 2.2 million. I feel like I can stomach it. Okay. Well, I'm okay with the fee structure, so I wouldn't change a thing. You wouldn't change anything? I said, if it fits you and it's who you are, I said, I'd do it different. I can tell you that. Our firm, we would do things a little differently because we have a different mentality. But if you want to be this ultra growth, ultra risk, live on the edge kind of guy, you're right where you're supposed to be. So he left there with confidence. But we go through and give people that itemized receipt so they can walk out of there knowing, hey, I got a fair price. Or I'm actually doing real well. I got a real decent, real low price. Or you know what? Gosh, there's some things to work on. But either way, they walk out with information. So the first thing you can do for your retirement, know what you're paying for stuff. Don't just assume and don't just trust that it's 1% total. I almost can almost always promise you it's never just the 1%. But we'll do that digging, that hard lifting for you. Let's talk for a moment about the second pillar. There's two certainties in life, right? Death and taxes. And there is a way to pay taxes when it is more enjoyable. I'm not going to say fun, but I'm going to say more enjoyable. Now, before I go into it, let me tell you this. Anytime you do tax planning, tax preparation, you're making strategies, changing from one taxable situation to a different one, make sure your CPA, your financial planner, they're on the same page. If you don't have a team working for you of an elder law attorney, a CPA, and a financial planner, and they're not talking, you just got a guy or a gal working for you. You don't have a team. You're probably at a place in life where it's no longer about having just someone who I hope they do right by me. I need a team to make sure that I'm covered on all bases. That's one of the things we love to do is work with CPAs and elder law attorneys to make sure that your team is prepared for you. But anytime you make strategies or changes to taxes, have them on the same page. But oftentimes, when we look at taxes, we look at it just like this. Oh. Go ahead. Oh my gosh. Um, What's been, where's all your money gone, Daddy? Taxes. Nine, 10, 11. Let me fix my houses. But it's okay. It's part of the game. No, it's not. It it's is. Not fun to... It's not fun to what? <laughs> it's the worst part of the game. Of, it's what? Taxes. <laughs> it really is the worst part of the game. <laughs> it almost sounds like some of our annual reviews sometimes, you know? <laughs> Taxes, oh my goodness. Do they have to be this frustrating, debilitating feeling? Does it have to feel like I am just stuck with this? I'll tell you what. There are times when it makes more sense for you to pay taxes than it makes sense for the IRS. Let's take just for a moment the current tax code. I'm not going to get political. I'm not going to tell you if you should love it, hate it, whatever else. I'm going to agree, and I think we're all going to agree, that we're just going to talk about what it, mean, what it means to us at the end of the day. So one thing that it does mean is just like in that grocery store, when you go around and you see these yellow stickers and stuff's on sale, I say, okay, what that thing's on sale. Whenever you see a sale sticker, here's what it has. The old price, the new price, and this third piece. There's a time frame for how much longer that's going to be on sale. You may go in there, and something that was $15 last week is $12 this week. And it tells you, you can buy it for $12 bucks for only for the next seven days. At the end of these seven days, I promise you, it's going back to the real price. And when we buy that, oftentimes, like the milk, I have this fridge in our garage. When milk goes on sale... I don't buy enough to get us through this week. I buy three or four extra gallons because those boys are going to pound through it. I know I'm going to go through it. I know it's part of our life. I will have to use that milk at some point. So I might as well buy them while they're on sale. If we look at taxes for the moment, not for everybody, but for a lot of people in America right now, taxes just went on sale. What was 15% just went down to 12. So it's a 3% sale. What was 25% went down to 22. It's a 3% sale. Do we know how long this sale goes on? We do. December 31, 2024. January 1 of 2025, a lot of these things are set to expire. We already know the length of the sale. Well, does it matter if I buy taxes now or buy them later? Because ultimately, at the end of the day, the number one expense for retirees is taxes. It's important to know what you're paying for them. If something's going to cost me guaranteed 25% in four years, five years, when my RMDs kick in, but today I can pay 22% for it, maybe I should. What are some opportunities to capitalize on? Again, you don't have to love it, you don't have to hate it, whatever it is, can you make advantages for you and your family based on the tax code? You can. You can buy some taxes while they're on sale. The most common way people talk about it is Roth IRA conversion. Taking money that's pre-tax, 
paying taxes on it, and then letting it become a tax-free investment. For years, you've had a tax-deferred investments, 401ks, IRAs, 403b, SEP, simple keg, whatever, any of these pre-tax accounts that you've had, that you've put this seed in the ground, tax-deferred, and the IRS says, don't worry about it, we'll settle up later, I promise you it'll be cheaper, right? Well, that only really works out if taxes drop much lower, which I can't imagine they will, or you take a pay cut. Who wants, who's excited about that retirement pay cut, right? Nobody. But yet we look at taxes in a way and say, I'm sure it'll be cheaper in the future. No, I, I can promise you that in four or five years, it's going back up. So should you pay a little extra, get some more taxes? Take them, tax the new seed, put it in the ground after tax, that way your harvest is completely tax-free. The IRS loves 401ks, IRAs, because why? They let you put your 250,000 in the account, your company puts their 250,000 in the account, it grows to a million dollars, and then they get to tax the whole million. They love it. And all they had to do was let you put in this 500 between you and your company and say, we'll settle up later when it's cheaper. Now, if something drastic comes up, some emergency, some bad thing happens, and you need all million dollars out, how much money do you really have? Well, in the state of Michigan, we pay four and a quarter state. We have 37.6% federal. You're going to lose 43% of your money. About $430,000 of your million goes to taxes, and you get 570. Now, do we ever pull out a million dollars of pre-tax? Pretty much never. But we always want to take the what ifs out and say, is there something I can do now to lower that RMD at 72 now? Can I lower my tax consequences in the future? Can I get rid of some of the potential taxes on my Social Security? Can I get rid of the possibility of raising my Medicare premiums if I hit that magic number, that Magi number? Yeah. We can do some conversion now into something like a Roth IRA. That's the first option. The second option, it's not for everybody, but we do it a lot with our private wealth sector, with our, with our higher net worth clients, is we do what's called IUL conversion. We take money that's pre-tax, we pay taxes on it, and create opportunities to create longer lasting legacies, a tax-free income for you, or a big tax-free benefit for your kids and grandkids. It's not for everybody. But if you hit that mark where you're a million and a half, two million dollars, you say, I know I'm not gonna go through all this stuff. What should I do with it? There's a great opportunity. The third thing is trust conversion. If you're really passionately concerned about getting this money into irrevocable trust and protecting it from Medicaid spend down, you're absolutely dead set on it. And I'll tell you, there's some other options out there that I tend to lean more towards, but we, our elder law attorneys love them. But if you're intent on that, maybe you should start paying some money on pre-tax money and putting it in these irrevocable trusts. Start that five-year clock and start protecting it. There are options out there. But it's important to review them all and have these conversations in almost every single meeting you have with your financial planner. So that's one of the opportunities. Number one, know what your fees are. Number two, take advantage of taxes when it's on sale and it's a discount to you, not when it goes back up to full price for the government. Let's talk for a moment about income. There's that old saying, without income, there's no such thing as retirement. So here's a three legged stool of retirement that's been around for a long time. Pensions, social security, and personal savings. Now, we've all been at a restaurant where one of the t legs of the table is not as long as the others, right? We've all been at the wobbly table and you sit there and you deal with it until the engineer or the OCD person in the family gets up and fixes it. They can't handle it anymore. Well, here's what the three-legged stool was supposed to look like years ago, but here's what it looks like today. Right now, less than 9% of the current workforce will retire with a lifetime pension. Social Security on their own website and statements say that by about 2034, which man, that's so far off in the future. No, it's really not, it's about 14 years away. They have to cut benefits up to 25%. This isn't an opinion thing, this is just what they're telling us. So we know that pensions are disappearing. Social Security has some, we'll call it funding issues, is that an appropriate way to say it, right? They have some funding issues. So if nothing else, our personal savings is looking more and more like a pogo stick than a three-legged stool. This is an uncomfortable stool to sit on. So we need to make sure that in that stool, in that leg of the stool, our taxes are appropriate and being paid when it benefits us the most, that our fees are as low as possible because I'm so dependent on that portion. I need that thing to last. I need it to be my safeguard all the way through. When we look at our personal savings, oftentimes that's where we consider our risk. How much risk should I have in there? Let me ask you this. How much of your retirement income do you want to have at risk? Anybody? Anybody? If anybody says something besides zero, that's the first time in one of our workshops ever, right? I don't mind risking my portfolio, but don't touch my paycheck. That's how pretty much everybody in retirement feels. 
But yet oftentimes people say, you know what, if things happened, if the market corrected, if something bad happened, we could tighten our belts if we needed to. I had a couple sitting right in the front, right about where, right about where you two are sitting right there. And as they came in, I said, Does anybody, what would you give up? What would you have to give up if you lost 25% of your income? He raised his hand. I said, what is it? He says, her yoga classes. <laughs> she said, no, it's his NFL Sunday ticket. <laughs> Whatever it is, we all know what the other one needs to sacrifice for the cause, right? But at the end of the day, do we want to risk our income? Should we be looking at income through the lens of risk or from the lens of, you know what? This part of the pie is secure and guaranteed. This part of the equation has already been solved. The other part that has variables in it, that's okay, but it's not the part that changes my perfect retirement days. Giving each instrument in the portfolio a part to play, an intentional part that makes sure that it works together with all the other pieces, but it's not dependent on the other pieces. That's how we build out portfolios. How much risk should I have? What is the risk versus reward discussion? I'll tell you this. Remember I talked about work and money versus retirement money? Here's work and money. It's climbing that mountain as fast as you can. If you slip and fall, hey, when you climb a mountain like this, it's risky. You get to the top really fast. You know where else you can get really fast? The bottom. How many of you are past the point of thinking that this looks like fun? Right? We took our kids to a Michigan adventure this summer, and I sat in line for an hour and a half with my two oldest boys, and uh, we rode something called the corkscrew. And if you know what the corkscrew is, I think it's Latin for wait an hour and a half, ride in a minute and 10 seconds, and feel sick all day. So that's what happened. We rode this roller coaster. We waited an hour and a half. It took a minute and 10 seconds to ride it to wreck the rest of my day. <laughs> that's how I feel about roller coasters at this point. And when I look at this picture right here, I think, man, oh, man. I sure hope that not only does she do it right, but the mountain does its part right. Because here's the problem. What if she does every ounce of research correctly, does everything right, knows exactly where to step, and steps in all the right spots? But this time, some of the rocks slip. The mountain gives way. She did everything right, but the mountain didn't do its part. Who pays the price? She does. The mountain fails her, but yet she's the one who falls. Retirement investing, retirement planning looks like this. I'm still getting to the top of this mountain, but boy, is it slower. But here's the big difference. When you climb like this, you go up a couple feet, maybe 8, 10, 15, 20, 30 feet. You find a rock. You sink the anchor in the rock. You put your carabiner and you run your ropes through. You do all of these things, even though you're sure-footed and everything's going great. Why would I stop now? I'm climbing well. I'm stopping now because just in case. I put all these safeguards in place. I put these anchors in. So I don't know what's ahead of me, but I've accomplished this thus far. So I put those anchors in. And I climb up another 10, 15. And the great part about climbing like this is you can set how long of a rope you want to give it. If you're really uncomfortable, you only have to give yourself a five-foot rope. If you're a little more comfortable with it, you can give yourself a 20, 30, 50-foot rope. It's up to you. But you set that length. And then you go through and you climb a little more and you set another anchor, another carabiner, another bunch of ropes. And you set it because why? Because if the mountain gives way and you start slipping and falling, you've predetermined I'm only okay with, okay with falling this much before I need all these safety provisions I put in place to catch me. There is a limit to how much I can stomach at this point in my life. And that's what it means to climb retirement-wise. We need to put safeguards in place, not when we're falling, because if you're this person and you start falling, you say, man, I should start putting some ropes and anchors in this mountain. It's too late. We need to build out plans that say, before there's problems, before there's hazards, the things I can't even see ahead of me, I'm going to put in safeguards to make sure that no matter what happens, I will be okay. People come in and we talk risk quite a bit, and uh, they use these terms, aggressive Moderate, conservative. My least favorite of all of them is moderately conservative. It's the most ambiguous term in finance, I think, to a certain extent. Um, it's like when you go to the doctor's office and they, you say, hey, I'm not feeling well. And they do some tests and they run some things and they say, it's a viral infection. That's doctor speak for I don't know. Not offending any doctors. I'm just telling you what it is. I don't know. So what are we going to do? We're going to throw what's called broad spectrum antibiotics. We're going to throw a whole bunch of stuff at you. Something's got to work and it's gonna fix you and hopefully bring you back. If it doesn't work, check back in in a week or two. We'll throw a whole nother span of antibiotics at you and see what happens. Something has to work, okay? 
if it's, if it's a cold or maybe even a really light flu, that's okay. If it's pneumonia, not so okay. If it's something more serious, I can't do broad spectrum. I need specific to me. But yet we use these terms. Why is it easier to use these terms? Because it's easier to herd clients like cattle into generic groups. At LifePlan, we're very anti-cookie cutter. We're big on custom built. You'll see on the folders we handed out tonight, everything says drafting a plan for what's next. A custom built plan for you. Why? Because we learned this a long time ago. Your experiences, what you've been through, your story determines from the past, determines what you want your story to look like in the future. If you were brilliant and got out of the market October 14th, 2007, and you said, you know what? I feel like something bad's coming over the next 18 months. I'm going to go inverse. You probably made a ton of money and love crashing markets. But for the other 99.999% of everybody, you get that sick feeling still when you talk about what you went through in 2008. So to hear people say generic terms like that and then just say, it's okay, I'm not okay with it. I had a guy who came in one of our workshops. He was sitting right back about right where you're sitting. And he sat there, and as, as we're going through this workshop, just arms are crossed. I mean, shooting daggers out of his eyes. The whole, I'm convinced if he could have come across the table and punched me in the mouth, he would have done it. And I've never met him before. But I mean, angry, angry face at me the whole night. It's like he was just sucking on lemons the whole time. And we go through the end. We get to the end of this whole um, of our workshop, and Brian goes around, and he sets appointments for about 45 minutes for us to sit down and talk. And as he goes to this table, Bob signs up for an appointment. I thought, great, this guy's going to take time out of his week to come cuss me out. <laughs> I don't know why. I've never met him. So he comes in, him and his wife. They come in, they sit down. And I say, Bob, I just got to be honest with you, right before we even get started, I, I saw you. I remember you from the presentation, vividly. You obviously didn't enjoy it. I just got to know, I want to know why you're here. He says, it wasn't you. It wasn't even what you're saying. In 1998, I retired from Ford. I had $1.8 million. So I went to an advisor and he said, well, got 1.8, you're about 55 years old. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna keep you pretty aggressive because this money has to last a long time. So we put him into some aggressive things and we all know what happened, the three year crash. So he went from 1.8 million down to about 1.1. And then what happens? Well, we double down because the market's down. He had, an, he had a, an advisor who had a focus on growth exclusively. And so he went through and he doubled down and he recovered about to 1.5 million by the start of the 2007 financial crisis. He finally fired this advisor at the end of 2008 at $600,000. I said, well, Bob, if nothing else, you're loyal literally to a fault. I mean, that's the definition. I said, what took you so long? Every time I went in to see this guy, here's what he would do. He would say, Bob, we got three options. We can either really just bail out and get on the sideline and cut our losses, but I got to tell you, you're so young, we got to make that money back. We can stay where we are and just ride out the storm. Or you know what? Now's the time, in my opinion, to double down. Let's go get some of that money back. Let's go emerging. Let's go international. Let's go to the places we know for a fact that when this thing swings back positive, they're gonna make us more money. And so Bob said, why are you asking me? I'm paying you 1%. Figure it out and tell me. The guy kept coming back to him. What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? So finally, in two, the end of 2008, Bob said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do. I'm gonna do this by myself. He worked hard. He fired that advisor, went right to the store, bought two TVs, went and set them up at home, right to, connected to his computer, and went back to work full-time managing his own portfolio. Bob's a very, very smart man. He came to us at the start of 2018 with $2.2 .2 million. If I could hire him, I would, I'll tell you what. But he was risky. So when I first asked him, I said, let's talk about what your comfort is with risk. He goes, oh, I'm aggressive. Okay, why are you aggressive? Because I have to be. You have to be aggressive? Yeah. I said, Bob, you're in your 70s. You have $2.2 .2 million. How much are you pulling out of this thing every year? Mike, it's steep. It's about $20,000 a year. I said, I don't even need a spreadsheet for this. I'll tell you, you'll be fine. Let's go put, you can put it in the bank and make half a percent and probably be fine. But tell you what, I'm going to run some reports. And if we can agree that you've reached your destination, you can take your foot off the gas a little bit. Does that sound like it would be a benefit to you? He says, yeah, absolutely. So I said, all right, let me go to work for you. So our team put together a plan and we dug deep into it, ran them a receipt, did some income planning, looked at risk, look at the tax ramifications, built out a plan. I came back to him and said, Bob, if you make half a percent the rest of your life with RMDs, all these different things factored into it, 
you're going to live to 101 and still have about $1.2 million. Is that enough to be comfortable? He says, yeah, it really is. I said, let's take our foot off the gas. I don't think you're aggressive anymore. He says, I'm really not. He came on with us, became a wonderful client. You know who's really happy about it? Not Bob, Nancy. She got her husband back. They had these visions of traveling. You know, there's this, this train that rides through the Canadian Rockies. They are finally taking that trip this summer. Why? Because he finally is allowed to walk away from the computer. Going through and understand someone's story. Now, if he just told me, you know what, Mike, I'm aggressive. And I say, hey, sounds good. You can afford it. You're at 2.2 million. Let's throw in some aggressive portfolios. We remember what happened in the first quarter of 2018. He would have experienced immediately two flash crashes. And then looked at me and said, here we go again. But once I heard his story, once I understood what he had been through, I can really understand where he wants to go and how he wants to get there. So generic terms, those work for 25 and 30 year olds. But at this point, you deserve better. You deserve someone who knows where you are at this point in your life. You deserve someone who has a team working for you and who's looking at all the different pieces to make sure you get to spend the time on the beach doing what you want to do. What kind of plan fits who you are today? We go to the pediatrician a lot. I said I have four kids. Actually, with the three boys, we end up half the time in the urgent care because of something stupid that happened. But that's how it goes. I've learned with boys, you need good insurance. With my daughter, I just need a lot of patience and love. But what kind of plan fits you? We go to the pediatrician a lot, not for me, but for my kids. My wife and I go to our general family doctor. My mom has a cardiologist. Why? Because she has a pacemaker that got put in several years ago. She needs a specialist who deals with that specific part of her body when it comes to that. It's a safety issue. Really specific things based on where you are in life. Do you have a, a plan that fits you who you are today? Or was it designed 30 years ago and we're just going to ride this thing out? Is it written and detailed? Or is it a plan of, and this is the one I hear the most, well, if I make six and take four, I should be okay. If I make 6% and take out 4%, things should be okay. I can't argue that side of the math. What happens when you, instead of making six, you lose 20? Well, as long as I average 6%, I should be okay. There's a thing called sequence of returns. I'm not going to get deep into it tonight, but basically it says if you're taking money out of your accounts, it does matter when you lose. If you're, if you're 20 years old and you're invested in the market, it really doesn't matter when the downtimes come as long as you're there for the good times. But the day you start looking at this giant pile of money that you've worked so hard for, not as a future resource, but as today's income, it matters when you lose money. Is it written in detail out to make sure you're protected, or are you just hoping that you do better than the market? Does anybody recognize this? When does this happen on flights? Right? At the, at the start of the flight. Why do they tell you this at the start of the flight? The amount of flights that need this information is so minuscule. There's so few flights that ever need it. Why do they give it to you on every single flight? Well, frankly, because by the time you need that information, it's a little late to start educating you. If a plane starts having issues and the oxygen mask drop down, do you have the time, patience, or wherewithal to sit and watch the screen from Delta come down and you watch that five-minute cartoon? No. One guy told me it's because you need it before you need it. That's true. They are letting you know when they give you this speech, two things. Number one, we know this plane inside and out. It's not that we do Cessnas on the weekends and, you know, I, I like to watch movies about planes. No, I know this plane inside and out. I know not only how to get on, how to get off, all the safety precautions. And number two, they're telling you this specific crew knows what to do if things go bad. If things go south and everything just gets just not according to plan, we've already built in protocol to protect you against the bad things. If this thing starts going down, we're going to sully it right in the Hudson. We're going to do everything we can to keep you as safe as possible. And we're not going to figure it out with you on the fly. Could you imagine things start going bad, the, ma the mass drop down, and then the, the flight attendants go to the front and they say, all right, everybody, as you can see, things aren't great. We have three options. Number one, we could just ride it out. Number two, I think we could do the oxygen mass to see. And then they start taking a survey to see what you think we should do on their plane. That's a bad flight crew. There's no way I'd fly the airline again. What I like to know is that if anything goes south, that these guys have been through all the training, all the protocol, and know exactly what to do to keep me safe. 
Don't ask me my opinion in those situations. Tell me exactly what I need to do. I'm great at other stuff. You're great at getting me home safe. That's how it should be. But yet from a retirement planning standpoint, like Bob, oftentimes when things go south, we hear people say, well, here are your options. I don't need options. I need advice. I need guidance. I need counsel. I need to be told what we should be doing right now. We should be looking so far down the road. Again, not every flight needs the information, but if we're looking at just at 2021, 20, 22, and 23, and that's all we've mapped out, we're doing a disservice. We should be looking so far out that I can tell you in 2020, you're fine, but in 2045, you run out. We've built in the plans. We know how survivorship affects you. We know how long-term care affects you. We're looking down the road to make sure you're safe. It's detailed, it's line by line, it's not a single page spreadsheet. Now it's good to condense those things and understand them on a regular basis, but when someone's building out the initial plan, they better have a lot of details built in. Because if they're wrong, you're the one who pays the price. Does anybody recognize this picture? If you get it right, it's free dinner. A little nervous laughter, right? No, it's okay, we're paying for all of them, it's fine. It's Mount Everest. This group should have really gotten it. It's Mount Everest. Now, I mentioned Jeff earlier, who's sitting over here. Remember, he had the really risky, low-fee $2.2 million? When I asked it, we are at Brighton at a workshop, and he said, that's Mount Everest. I said, wow, that was really accurate and quick. How did you know that? He said, I've scaled it twice. Right? I had never met Jeff before, but I said, Jeff, it takes a special kind of crazy to do it once. Why in the world did you do it twice? He says, well, I did it, I accomplished it, I made it back down, I was sharing it with my friends and family, and then I had a really close friend who said, you know what, I was thinking about doing that, would you do it with me? He says, if you do it quick, I'm still in shape, we better do it quick. So they did it again. And I said, Jeff, I just got to ask you, again, this is in a workshop, I've never met him before, I said, I got to ask you, what's the best part? And I know what the best part is, standing on that peak, on the summit, looking out over all of God's creation, saying, you know what, this is such a place that so few have ever been or ever will be. I get to stand on top of this mountain. He said, making it home is the best part. You stand on top of this mountain, you realize I'm only halfway done. Right around 300 people have died scaling Mount Everest. What a lot of people don't know is that 80% died on the descent. It's heartbreaking because they reached their goal, but they never made it home. They never were able to share it with their friends and family and experience the things they intended. It's a different trek to the top than it is to the bottom. There's different dangers, there's different risks, and there's different protocol. Now, I have no intentions of scaling Mount Everest. Not even a little bit. I'll do the Utah. I'm not doing Mount Everest. But if I did, I would want two things. Number one, a really detailed and recent satellite image map. I don't need pictures from 1970. I don't need rules from 1995. I need a detailed recent map that shows me not only just how to get to the top, how to get to the bottom, but also here's where you are allowed to step. And you know what? Even though you don't know it, if you step here, it will be fatal. If you stop and spend the night here, you will not wake up. It's just important to know the things that could derail you as it is to know the things that will get you there. And then a map that gets me all the way down to the bottom. That's the first thing. The second thing I want is a guide who does Mount Everest every single time. I don't care if you've scaled Mount Brighton. I don't care if you like National Geographic and are passionate about tall things. I need you to know exactly how Mount Everest works up and down. You can't experience Mount Everest with me for the first time as my guide. Let's say you're a guide and you say, I've done so many mountains, but I'm so excited to do Mount Everest with you today. It's my first time and I'm your guide. I will not be in that group. Why? Because if you're wrong, as the guide, if you're wrong, I don't make it home. If you're wrong, I pay the price. So why are we here tonight? Well, number one, this steakhouse is delicious. You don't have to pay me to come here. I can talk about this stuff all night and I'll eat here every night, it's fine. But number two, most of us realize that as we look at this, as we've covered these things, like Bob, he says, you know what? Nobody's ever had these conversations with me. All we talk about is rate of return. All we talk about is someday we'll deal with this stuff. And most people get to a point, they say, I deserve better than someday. I deserve better than we should get to. I deserve better than we should be okay. We deserve to know that we will be okay. So we're here tonight because we're gonna offer a 45 minute conversation. The 45 minute conversation is with me. You come to our office at the McPherson Mansion, two blocks north of here. 
And as we sit down and talk, we hear your story from start to finish. What got you here, where you want to go, and how you want it to be. And from there, we start working on building a custom plan for you. So Brian's going to come around with my calendar. And over the next, uh, I think he cleared out the next, what, three to five days, seven days? These 45-minute windows of talk. I'll tell you, if you fish, it's going to be an hour because i got some good stories. But otherwise, 45 minutes to have coffee and talk. And at the end of that, you're going to walk out with confidence in your current plan or hope that we're going to get it right. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. If you have any questions, flag me down afterwards and we'll talk on a one-off. But uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, have a great night. Thank you.